from the West Coast. Um, for those of you that don't know, my name is Michael Schreck. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Collegiate Sports Management Group, and we'd like to welcome you to our inaugural Empowerment Series here. We appreciate you joining us here. First and foremost, hope that everybody is staying safe and healthy. We are going to be hosting uh, several panels here in the next 10 weeks. They're going to be bi-weekly Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern, and they're going to be covering several topics, including esports, data and analytics, <clears throat> leadership, and women in sports, among other topics. And we're extremely excited to be able to kick off this empowerment series. We are very fortunate to have several key leaders and executives in the industry uh, here with us today to provide insight and perspective on a variety of topics, kicking off with name, image, and likeness today. Those of you that have questions, I know you're all muted right now, please utilize the chat box in Zoom, and we will try to get to the questions as best we can uh, throughout the course of the panel. As I mentioned, today's topic is name, image, and likeness as it relates to collegiate athletics. A special thank you to all the panelists that are here to participate today. And I'm gonna give you a brief introduction uh, and a little bit of a bio as to everybody that's participating today. First and foremost, we have Dr. Schiller on the line with us, one of the most accomplished sports and entertainment executives over the last 50 years. We are extremely fortunate at Collegiate Sports Management Group that he's our current chairman. Some of the previous roles that Dr. Schiller has held include being the first founding CEO of Yankee Global Enterprises. He was the president of Turner Sports, the executive director of the United States Olympic Committee. He was the commissioner of the SEC Conference, and he's a United States Air Force Brigadier General. Thank you for being here, Dr. Schiller. The next panelist is Vince Thompson. Vince is the chairman, founder, and CEO of Melt, an award-winning agency based out of Atlanta. Vince represents, Vince and Melt represent several global, national, and regional brands and focus on marketing, sponsorship, activation, and content creation. Vince has won several uh, marketing awards and is an extremely uh, distinguished sports marketing executive. Vince, thank you for being here. Thank you, Mike. Our next panelist is Amy Huckhausen. <clears throat> Amy is currently the commissioner of the America East Conference and has been for the past nine years. Amy also spent time working at the NCAA in the compliance division and will have great insight and perspective on today's panel. Amy holds an MBA from MIT. Amy, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Neil Malvone is also on the panel. Neil's current responsibilities include Vice Chairman of the NJCAA for Esports. Neil is also an Executive Vice President of Business Affairs and Strategic Partnerships for Collegiate Sports Management Group. Neil was one of the first professors to write esports curriculum at an institution across the nation and did that at Caldwell University. Neil also leads all vertical um, responsibilities for CSMG in esports. Neil, thank you for being here today. Thank you. And our final panelist is Jason Belzer. Jason is currently the president of Game Inc. and co-founder of Athletic Director U. Jason brings a ton of knowledge and expertise across all sides of collegiate athletics. He's currently a professor at Rutgers University. He's an entrepreneur and he's an agent representing dozens of college coaches across the country. Jason, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. And finally, moderating today's panel um, is Ray Katz. Ray Katz has held many leadership positions across the sports industry uh, during his tenure in sports, making stops at the NFL, Madison Square Garden, the Disney Company, and OMD. I'm extremely privileged and proud to call Ray Katz a friend and a business partner, 
He's currently the Chief Operating Officer of Collegiate Sports Management Group, as well as a professor at Columbia University. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ray to kick off the panel. Thank you all again for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Mike. And uh, I share that privilege to be business partners with you and Neil and, and have uh, Dr. Schiller as our chairman as well. Um, I thought what I would do to kick the panel off today in, in preparation, we have uh, over 160 people on it. I'm sure not everyone's read the NCAA task force 31 page document. So what I thought I would do, I would just cover some of the principles, guidelines, and guide rails that the NCAA is considering um, as they move forward and figure out how to modernize their NIL bylaws, names, image, and likeness specifically. And they've pulled together a task force of division, divisional presidents, commissioners, athletic directors, coaches, and even athletes. And kudos to them for doing that. It's very strong. Um, everybody's really getting a voice, all key constituents. Uh, from a principles and guidelines standpoint, the NCAA is trying to truly assure that student athletes are treated similarly to non-student athletes with respect to commercial activity, unless there's a compelling reason to differentiate. They want the rules to be transparent, focused, enforceable, and facilitate fair and balanced competition. Um, also important is uh, making it clear that compensation for athletics performance or, or participation is impermissible and that is to be differentiated from the notoriety and followings from a social media standpoint that athletes get because of their competition. So that's a real subtlety we'll get into. I'm looking to, of course, uh, protect the recruiting environment and prohibit inducements to select, remain at, or transfer to a specific institution. So um, a big piece of that is gonna be how boosters get handled, both boosters that are intrinsically involved with the program as a differentiating factor from boosters that are just buying season ticket holders. And then making sure that compensation received for NIL activities uh, represent a genuine payment for the use of their NIL specifically and not a disguised form of pay for play as well. And this is an area that I think is gonna be worth discussion. Schools and conferences playing no role in a student athlete's NIL activities. That's gonna be one worth discussing in areas that I've heard Vince talk about in particular, game worn jerseys where maybe collaboration is necessary. Um, and then student athletes not being compensated for uses of their NIL in situations where they have no legal rights. So some talk about um, NCA trying to get this in front of Congress so it's managed nationally and not on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, with that, let's uh, kind of dive into the discussion areas today. Uh, maybe let's go around the room, starting with Dr. Schiller, uh, in terms of sort of the biggest opportunity and maybe most substantial threat from your perspective or your seat as it relates to some of these changes that are coming down the pike in NIL targeted um, for uh, September 2021. Well, thanks for that question. I'm not sure anyone can answer all of this. Uh, I think it's like the wild, wild west. You know, the, there's a saying, the revolution only tells you something that already took place. So a lot of this has already happened in different ways, as you mentioned, boosters and such. But remember that um, NCAA athletes who compete in things like the Olympics are allowed to bring in sponsorship to cover certain training things, swimmers and others. Uh, haven't uh, compromised their intercollegiate eligibility by having sponsors help them. So maybe there's a way to get through this in a very, very structured way. But I think the downside is going to be the amount of challenges and litigation that's going to follow by individuals and groups. And maybe, maybe from a conference perspective, it could be one good side that the conferences put together some general rules that they can apply by for the competition they want between their schools. But it also could lead to some of the major players, I'm not suggesting the big four or five, start thinking about breaking away from the NCAA, which has been rumored for a long time. So I think the upside again is that maybe some individual athletes have a little more money in their pocket, but the downside is all the unknown and what all this could bring in terms of adding some chaos to the intercollegiate world. Thank you. Let's, um, let, let's move on to Amy, because Amy sat at so many of these uh, different seats, power conferences, mid-major conferences, group of five, and then the NCAA. 
Yeah, I, I would agree with Dr. Schiller in terms of the benefits. There's no question that uh, what, what, however these rules end up, you know, all individual student athletes, whether you're the most popular, or most famous, in terms of your media coverage, to the most, you know, the least known um, person on, on any given team at a big school or, or at a smaller school, you now have sort of an equalized chance to <clears throat> the, the opportunity in terms of your ability to, to capitalize on your image like that. I think, I think that is a very positive development <clears throat> as we go forward, but there continue to be a lot of challenges like we just, like we just heard uh, across a lot of different areas in terms of the regulatory framework of how we're going to do this in a way that protects student athletes. And that's my, my biggest concern through this, through this exercise. And as we build the structures, making sure that our student athletes, while they have great opportunities ahead of them, there are also a lot of real world challenges that they're going to have to deal with now, just like all, all of us <clears throat> in terms of how we arrange our, our own, you know, job contracts, if we have contracts or just any sort of deal that we have, uh, whether, you know, we, ha you know, we're, they're going to need a guidance and assistance to make sure that folks are not trying to take advantage of them. And we have real life examples of that in pro sports already. And so that to, to, to think that that's not going to happen to some of our, our college student athletes <clears throat> is naive. And I think build, building in the guardrails to protect all the things like recruiting and booster involvement are important. There's no question, but fundamentally to me, it's about protecting our student athletes as they, as they embark on these opportunities. Thank you. That's a great perspective. And when you say the word opportunity, I have to turn it over to Vince Thompson. That's going to talk about some of the enormous opportunities that his brands are going to have as well as his company in this, uh, in this environment. I think you referred to them as seismic shifts, Vince, in a number of your podcasts. Yeah, I would, I would say that the word or the theme of the day within all of college athletics is the word seismic uh, or the, what I'll say, the forced modernization of the NCAA. Um, I'm a, a big advocate, obviously, for the rights of student athletes the first, since the first day I stepped on campus at Auburn University in 1980. Um, these kids are obviously dedicated. Uh, if I'm hiring, I want to hire student athletes first. And so uh, I'm a big advocate for it. I've got a son that's a freshman at the University of Georgia. He's able to do things that, say, Jake Fromm was not able to do. But I always like to sort of reshift the debate or reshift the topic while I'm talking about this. I know we all focus on the 0.1%, the Tua's, the Trevor's, the Fromm's, the Bo Nix's, um, you know, those, those types of athletes. But the 99.9% .9 of them, I think it's going to be an incredibly positive um, thing. I use the Auburn women's equestrian team. Outstanding young ladies represent empowerment, working as hard as the football and basketball teams, won many, many national championships. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with them being able to be compensated uh, for their success. And I also believe it's going to bring in new revenue to the athletic departments in the non-revenue sports. So I think the, the positive law of unintended consequences is going to rain here. So what about saddle sponsors, boot sponsors, barn sponsors, uh, feed and seed sponsors, and those types of things, and putting some money in the pockets of the student athletes, and then allow uh, the athletic departments to have a share uh, on that big, as well as uh, the teams, as well as uh, the, the kids. And so uh, I see nothing uh, but positive outside. You know, we've always had booster pressure in major college athletics and that's not going away uh today and it won't go away tomorrow based on what's going on out there so uh, i think it's uh very long overdue and i think it's going to be a positive um particularly also for the career development of these athletes because they can showcase themselves in a lot broader manner than in the past thank you so much vince and, and now let's move on to jason and then uh Finally, Neil, but let's start with Jason and talk about impact as it relates to coaches, as it relates to the uh, macro industry as you see it. Well, as it relates to coaches, I think that it's just going to be another recruiting tool. And if we're going to look at that from only that perspective, then obviously the richer is going to continue to get richer. I mean, the bigger universities with the larger campuses and the larger fan bases are going to offer more opportunities for student athletes in terms of residual income than a lot of the smaller schools. But the reality is that most elite level blue chip prospects are already signing with the Ohio States and Dukes of the world. So I don't think there's going to be a substantial change, um, but the, the riff will still continue to grow there. 
I think there's a lot of opportunity from a market standpoint. If you look at the total sponsorship footprint of college athletics right now, it's about $1.3 billion. If we can maybe assume that 20 to 30% of that max probably will shift over to the student athletes, you're looking at a total market of about 200 to 300 million a year. Uh, and I think that actually will be a little bit of an issue for college athletics programs because, um, you know, as we see now, Learfield and a lot of these other MMR agencies that are guaranteeing rights by the millions to these universities are having a little bit of a difficult time paying uh, on those rights. So if the money shifts over to the student athletes, the NCAA has said that they don't want to have schools have a super hands-on approach with brokering these deals. I think what's going to end up happening is schools are going to have no choice but to try to get in on some of the money that's flowing because it's going to flow out of their coffers and directly to the student athletes. And I don't think that college athletics is sustainable, um, at least in the current model, if one third of the revenue suddenly disappears from the university's hands and goes directly to the student athletes. So I think well, I think we'll dig. I think we'll dig into that. Yeah, Jason, I think it's great. I think we'll dig into that. Um, it, it may be accretive. It may be incremental revenue opportunities because it could be great sources of activation. When we get to that, certainly interested in circling back to Vince. Um, thank you so much, Neil. What What would you like to add to that, uh, especially as it relates to maybe concluding? with the piece on esports, because esports seems to already be there. Yeah, the opportunities uh, for this new uh, policies coming down from the NCAA, esports certainly is going to be impacted by it. Uh, currently, as the vice chair of the NJCAAE, in our bylaws that we created a year ago, we included the opportunity for the esport participants and gamers to be able to continue making money on their Twitch accounts, their Mixer accounts, entering tournaments, winning prizes, uh, getting endorsements. So uh, we already we had a little bit of fore, foresight there on the eSports side. And so we expect uh, maybe the NCAA following a similar model to a certain extent. I also think there's opportunity for female women athletes now uh, where they weren't, uh, weren't seen as, uh, as a bigger part of the, of the campus or the athletic department now. Certainly uh, with their social media accounts, with their ability now to run camps, make some money doing that, starting their own businesses, et cetera. Uh, I think female athletes will now uh, have a, a bigger say, I think, across campuses. I also think small schools like Division II and Division III uh, athletes will also see uh, a, a, an uptick in, in terms of their recognition and, and certainly not the same level as a, as a Division I athlete, but certainly uh, they will have uh, they will have an opportunity now as well. The biggest threat I see is uh, is the blurred lines that we're going to have between agents and boosters and and uh, quote unquote no pay jobs. Um, I think that's something that the NCAA really has to focus on. I also think athletic departments have a have an additional burden coming in regard to compliance and making sure that the athletes are following the rules. And for small schools. That's an added burden that a lot of them just don't have the, the bandwidth to handle. So uh, I think uh, the NCAA has to do a really good job of maintaining those lines uh, before they get out of control. No, that's, uh, that's excellent. And, and then on the subject of uh, esports, sort of related to esports, you have to look at video games. And um, I, I'd certainly love to hear from you, Amy, since you've, you've um, had the NCAA experience as well as all the conference experience. How do you see video games um, and the potential uh, re-entry of EA uh, differentiating from broadcast in terms of all the legal that's gone on um, addressing both video games and then broadcast rights for names, image, and likeness? Because they seem to be two distinctly different paths. Yeah, I don't know that I have a good, a good answer, Ray. I, I think my limited legal understanding is they are distinct and I can't imagine that that will shift anytime soon unless I'm you know, just not mindful of something. Um, relative to video games, I know, you know, as soon as the Board of Governors announcement came out a few weeks ago after their meeting where they sort of endorsed the, the task force or working groups report, the thing that I saw most on Twitter was people asking about whether, you know, the video games were going to come back. And so I think we see where sort of the general populace, how they look at that. They, they really just want their video games. I, you know, as I look at the report and, and understand some of the conversations, at least in division one, they continue to find 
the um, the ability or the structure of a union to be difficult, if not impossible, under the guardrails that they have set forth. And at least as best as I understand about the ability to do a video game is you need some sort of collective unit to do that properly. <clears throat> I don't think anyone disputes the economics of a video game and how that would generate benefits and, and whatnot to all you know college football players in this particular example, if it's a football game. But the, the NCA, on the other hand, is trying to maintain this line of demarcation or bright line between employer and employee relationship. And I think that's one of the things that they <clears throat> have yet to solve that, that problem. Is, you know, how do you do that, allow a video game in a union or sort of collective unit to do that without crossing the employer employee line? Um, well, so if, if there's a solution out there, I'm sure people would be willing to, to, to explore it. But I think that's been one of the, the walls or dead ends that so far is my understanding. They've not been able to figure that, that one out yet. Well, I think certainly that's going to open up the conversation for group licensing rights, which we'll get into a bit later in this conversation. Um, I think the Keller case was you know, fairly clear in terms of it was settled uh, before determining whether the digital avatars violated student uh, athletes' rights of publicity. Uh, the Dreyer case clarified that uh, sports broadcasts don't violate. And then Marshall versus ESPN, again, sort of reinforced this from an NCAA-specific standpoint. Um, anyone on the panel, I'll open this up because this is kind of a tough area. Does anybody want to add anything, um, either Vince, uh, Neil, um, Dr. Schiller, or Jason? I'll just say a couple things about esports. I think um, I think the you know, we've all been out in the marketplace really trying to figure out what um, what esports meant into the, into the college athletic space. And if you look at it a couple of uh, three different ways, I think um, this is going to sort of continue to help evolve and accelerate that issue. I think secondly, uh, many universities were already using this as an academic recruiting tool tied to against STEM initiatives. Uh, and so I think that you will see an evolution of collegiate esports teams. Obviously, that's going to create new and incremental revenue. It's going to help academic recruiting. But as it relates to the EA platform, if you take the group licensing discussion out of it, I could see that being part of an esports strategy where if an EA game was tied around women's soccer, you could have that team on campus. Those royalties and rights could go. You could make it all inclusive with male and female. So, again, I see it, you know, as a positive upside. Uh, particularly if you had a cooperative publisher who had a vested uh, financial interest in it, because heretofore, my struggle was the publisher controls all the content, and so you had to have their buy-in, so Riot, League of Legends, or something like that. I see with EA, it could be a massive uh, collaborative uh, opportunity. No question. Anybody else want to add to that? It's great perspective, Vince. Thank you. I would just add also here, that the group licensing issue is going to be the biggest issue when it comes to esport publishers. You know, the O'Bannon case, that, that seminal case that, that started to push us down this road, uh, you know, to, to, to pay the, the student athletes in, in those uh, NCAA esport games. But again, it has to be in a group, it has to be by team, it has to be by association or conference. Otherwise, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, the, the, the gamers that are playing FIFA and 2K, et cetera, they want to play the teams. They want to play their favorite players. If we don't see that in a group collective effort on the college uh, scene, it's not going to work. So whether, it, whether the schools or the, or the conference or, or the association has to unionize or create a trade association to represent the entire collective, that is the road that is going to have to be taken from a gaming perspective when it comes to the esports side of this. Yeah, but the NCA, the NCA already captures sponsorships for championships and all to do some sharing of money among all divisions. So I think we're all being a little bit naive thinking that it's really going to get out of hand in another way. If everybody on this call was asked to come up with the solution together, we would probably follow what you're saying for for esports, that is, let's group everyone together and make sure that every individual athlete can benefit by this, this decision. There's not an unlimited amount of money available to pay all the people that we think are individuals and can earn it. And I defer to somebody like Vince, but there's a long line of professional athletes who thought that they can do a lot on their own and have not been able to do it. 
of the 3,000 and so professional athletes that play in four leagues, how many have you seen in an individual sponsorship on air in the last year? A handful? So the general benefit, I think, that can come out of this is for every single, to, every single college athlete to make a little bit more money to help pay their expenses and do all sorts of things. Absolutely. Well, I don't and, know. Sure. and then uh, just to, just to build on, on all that, Dr. Schiller, uh, in terms of all the athletes uh, benefiting a bit, um, you had referred to briefly the Olympic model. Um, how do you feel about the Olympic model with a few changes uh, applying to this situation, um, as it were, beyond the Olympic athletes that play college sports? Well, I mean, there's, you're talking about fewer people together in terms of the whole college world. And I think regardless of what people talk about, about the, the money, the revenue sports, it's all, this is all about football and basketball. That's what it, it's about those particular athletes on the campus. It's not about the swimmer or the fencer or the track and field athletes. So if we can come up with a solution for those that seem to be the most marketable, I think you solve the entire problem. It seems to have worked so far and people have been able to accept the money that individual athletes get in the Olympic sports, the real test is going to be for the big stuff. Vince, wouldn't you agree to that? A hundred percent. And, 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 you know, one of the solutions could be the language within the scholarship agreement or the contract, because if you look at what led to O'Bannon, that language in the contract, that athlete actually granted the use of the university's image and likeness in perpetuity uh, until the, you know, the, the red flags were raised. So I think, uh, if the athletes agree to the to the language in the scholarship contract, I think there'd have to be some modification on both sides because right now it's basically a one year indentured servitude agreement for you know renewable to university's leisure. So I think there's got to be a little give back on the other side. Uh, but if the backup center knew he was going to get a couple of nickels off of EA as opposed to Bo Nix as well, so uh, I could see that language being modified to really help accelerate this as well. No, exa exactly. Um, and then specifically, Amy, if I may address this one to you, um, how would you handle the ambiguous language in terms of compensation for participation versus compensation because of participation? Because it's a subtle difference, but it's definitively a difference. Obviously, uh, Trevor Lawrence is not supposed to get paid for his participation, but he will be worth a great deal of money commercially because of his participation? Yeah, that's a good question, right? I mean, I think we've had to deal with some of these distinctions in the rules compliance area for, for a long time, maybe not in the same way that, that, that student athletes could capture name image likeness um, because of their participation. But certainly there are lots of distinctions in bylaw 12, it doesn't mean that they're right or wrong, um, <clears throat> that, that sort of separate those things out. And I think, that's, but it, it's not easy. I'm not suggesting that it is easy. And I think this goes to some of the a point I think that was raised earlier by someone around what's legitimate <clears throat> and what is uh, the I'm paying you just because, right? And so I think that's one of the myriad issue or one of the more complex issues as we get into this too, is if using Trevor Lawrence as an example, um, he has great name recognition. He should be able to capitalize on that. But what's the right who's gonna set that market to determine what is the fair value of that uh, versus giving it, giving him money either today or when he was recruiting or being recruited rather um, in a way that's reflective of the market. I think that's the, that's the challenge, one of the many challenges that the association is gonna to have to wrestle with. No, no question we'll circle back to fair market value and valuation of sponsorship as well as valuation of endorsements because it's going to be especially critical here, not just in setting a, a fair price, but in terms of compliance. Um, so with that in mind, uh, Vince, you had discussed game-worn worn jerseys uh, and whose property are those jerseys and how do you split up the pie? Maybe um, it would be great if you could add a little insight and perspective on that because those will have great value promotionally as well as as auction items. Well, I think, um, you know, normal, you know, Auburn alumni like myself, um, you know, I may have an affinity for a particular player in a particular sport, and I might want to buy that jersey, that game-worn that game -worn jersey. If we could figure out the correct revenue split where uh, it's a rising tide where, and, you know, it's a, uh, the center that I was a favorite of, 
and then, and then there's also another cause and charity component to that as well. So we could put some money in some good hands, put the VIG into the athletic department, put some, uh, some uh, uh, delight a great fan, and, um, and put some money in athletics hands. And this is a discussion that I'm having. That's attached to an overall greater fan experience. I remember in the old days at Auburn, you could go on the field, you could shake the player's hands, you could get the autographs, you could, you know, he could give you one of his chin straps or some of that like that. We're going to have to do more of that to engage. This is even broader discussion that we're going to have to do that from a, from a spirit of fan engagement. Uh, but again, if you look at the Joe Burr example, or you look at the kid uh, from Stephen F. Austin, uh, where he dunked on Duke and won the ball game and the money went to hurricane relief and all of that, there is so much good to be had. There's so much money being left on the table. And I believe that this is going to open up, um, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of areas because you know, Dr. Schiller's point, you've got Olympian athletes scattered across college. You know, if you'd have had a pair of uh, Charles Barkley's, you know, uh, dream team trunks and, and uh, you know, back in the nineties or the eighties or whatever, you know, it just has a lot of value out there. So I, again, I see tremendous amount of upsides. Now where I am resolute is that, the athletic department or anybody that has a vested financial interest uh, in the athletic department, whether it be IMG Learfield or, or whoever it is, the Fox should not be guarding the hen house in this situation. I'm adamant about that. Um, Vince, real quick on the Fox hen house issue, and we'll get to this later. Do you see this being a bit different in terms of power five versus others? Because it would seem as though they're, they're very divergent um, opportunities and challenges. Well, I mean, I, I, that goes back to a broader discussion that's going on in Congress right now. Is the Power Five actually going to make a legitimate break from the NCAA? Is the NIL the stalking horse for that? Or do we apply the same rules equally across the board? And, you know, that's a whole nother big giant can of worms, Ray, uh, for another day. My prediction is the Power Five absolutely will break away and set their own rules. Great perspective. Thank you. And Jason, specifically, you, you are looking at this issue through so many different lenses from maybe athletes getting a little more value in a program relative to a coach wearing that hat, uh, your legal perspective on this, and then also your macro understanding of the entire industry and perspective. So I think you would, you would add a great amount here if, if you can. That'd be great. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, <clears throat> I don't see this accelerating the break of the NCAA, I think it's only going to help keep it together if uh, the Power Five institutions have the opportunity to make sure that the high-level student athletes that they're working with are going to be compensated. And Vince mentioned that a rising tide lifts all ships. Uh, if there's more money flowing into college athletics, that money is first and foremost going to go to the larger institutions. Uh, and it's going to help trickle down into the smaller ones. I do think, though, that there is a little bit of an issue at the Power Five level where you have smaller Power Five schools or smaller budgets like Iowa State that are going to now have to compete against the Texases of the world, and it's just going to become even more difficult for them to attract the type of recruits that they're going to need to compete consistently. So I don't know if it's going to be a long-term fix, um, but the reality is that name, image, and likeness is only going to help solidify the collegiate model if it's policed the right way uh, and the NCAA doesn't create more issues with the group licensing and the unionization. And somebody in the comments mentioned uh, that I don't think there is need for a union in college athletics if the NCAA or a third party can figure out the group licensing situation. And there are entities that are beginning to pop up that are going to try to address this. Uh, I think there's a technical solution to it. Um, and somebody's already going to be working on that infrastructure. If you can overcome the group licensing issue, then the NCAA is going to be in a really good position to pretty much ensure that student athletes don't have a lot of incentive to unionize. And that perhaps is the greatest uh, existential threat to the NCAA right now. So, so Jason, again, you work across divisions. So with that in mind, um, should there be definitive differences between some of the rules and regulations that come down across divisions um, as this uh, whole NIL piece gets uh, evolves and, uh, and gets re resolved over the next 18 months? I don't think so. I don't think that's necessary. Again, 
the vast majority of the money in the market is going to go to the elite athletes. So the reality is that if you're the quarterback at Clemson or the defensive end at Alabama, that's where you're, those are going to be the student athletes making most of the money. That being said, as Vince mentioned, the equestrian athletes at Auburn or uh, the backup point guard at Northern Colorado are all going to have value in themselves. And that value is going to be, uh, most seen in a group licensing situation or in a, a situation where people want to get access to influencers. And I think that's what's unique about this is that you have 400,000 student athletes, all who have varying degrees of social media followers. And this is a really amazing opportunity for brands that want to spend in college athletics who may be spending in college athletics or maybe can't because they don't have the bank rolls to get involved at a large or high level to enter the market and get access to influencers that can do campaigns for them in local markets in small markets and big markets. Um, so I don't think you're going to have to have different rules. I think in fact, that I think it's the opposite. I think you want to make things as simple as possible so that everyone can benefit and there isn't a lot of chaos. No, Ray, I, Ray I, would, I would tell you that I'm starting to hear from a tremendous amount of, of, uh, clients and corporations and sponsors who've not, who've been shut out of being able to advertise in the collegiate space, um, want to come in. So for instance, uh, and I'm not even talking about competitive, I'm talking about brand new categories of that maybe they couldn't afford to, you know, for the big ticket sponsorship at Auburn or Alabama or something like that. And now they're saying, Hey, we've got some money we want to spend. And, and, and Jay is spot on. Um, the influencer community because we've got to put a COVID umbrella over this. We don't know what the revenue model of college athletics is going to be going forward. And we don't know how long this is going to last. And so uh, again, I see, I, I'm getting, I've never seen this much interest from corp companies and I've never seen uh, three months ago ideas. I would take to companies and say, Hey, you're crazy. Now they're saying, Hey, maybe we want to think about this a little bit different way because if you're, a category sponsor of the SEC, you're basically shut out from that. And now there's going to be a lot of new companies coming in, which I think is going to benefit everybody. I think it's a great point. As Mike Shrek, our CEO, my business partner, likes to say, CSMG is open for business for all of those uh, tremendous opportunities beyond uh, the Power Five. So thank you on that. Amy, what would you add in terms of a perspective uh, as it relates to um, differences between the divisions? You've, you've sort of seen that uh, to a great extent working in true power five conferences, a group of five, and then ultimately mid-major conferences. How do you see that differentiating in terms of legality and as well as practicality? Yeah, I mean, I think a couple of comments. One, in the bigger buckets of division one, two, and three, division two and three have, have traditionally been more liberal with their bylaw 12 and amateurism rules than division one has. And that goes back, gosh, to almost 20 years when all three divisions were looking at their amateurs and task force and looking at prize money and, you know, can you, <clears throat> could you have been a professional before you enter college and what have you? Two and three were always more progressive in that area than division one. And that, I think that from what I understand, that's going to, has a potential to continue as those two divisions carve out their NIL rules going forward. I think the thing I'll add is a little bit different. <clears throat> a lot of the uh, attention, rightly so, goes to the Power 5 programs that are the most visible, most successfully generate the most revenue, all of that sort of thing. But I will also uh, share that some of the biggest concerns around NIL uh, flexibility are coming from Power 5 administrators. So while a quarterback at a Power 5 school has the potential to earn more money than a basketball player or football player at an FCS level, no question, <clears throat> generally speaking, the folks at the, the FCS and non-football levels are, are just less concerned about these NIL loosening of the rules because we don't experience the same recruiting environment and competitiveness and rules violations that happen at the other end of the spectrum. And so I think while there's certainly a lot of opportunities for the student athletes at the Power Five level, the administrative concerns and some of these things about recruiting and, and concerns about that are more acute at that level as well. They're the ones that are more concerned about recruiting and trying to make sure there's, you know, <clears throat> there's fair market and all that sort of thing, far more than, uh, you know, folks at, at the mid-major level are, because that's just not the world that we live in from a recruiting standpoint. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it seems D2 and D3 as well. I mean, you know, for example, there's not that much enforcement in D3. Uh, there's one you know, fairly major NESCAC donor who definitely helps the uh, athletic teams at his uh, university and alma mater in a way that maybe at a higher level would get uh, more scrutiny. And it's all up and up. It's, it's just uh, really helping with respect to competitive advantages and practice and things of that nature. Um, why don't we go to Q and A um, for a little bit, um, and and I'll sort of hit some of the the questions that have come up. Uh, what is going to prevent athletes from uh, navigating to schools essentially that um, will give them more guarantees on the commercial side? Uh, and we'll address that a bit more in terms of valuation and sort of the Zion Williamson Williamson example. But what is a, a kind of a way that uh, we can ma monitor that and manage that? that there's not a change. I'll, I'll leave that a little open-ended as well, or maybe Amy, it'd be best if you started. You, could you rephrase it? I, I... Sure, sure. Um, what is gonna stop athletes from navigating to a school like, from heading to a school like Duke even more than they do now, if it's clear that the exposure and the advantages for the same kind of player at Duke is gonna be very different than for that same player at Wake Forest or Boston College, as an example. Yeah, I, I don't know that. In my view, I don't know that that's a trend. I think Jason touched on this a little bit earlier. I don't know that that's gonna, we're going to see a big swing in that. There, there are a lot of advantages going to Duke right now. Those aren't changing. You know, there's a lot of exposure opportunities that someone who plays any sport at Duke gets that they may not get at another school. That, that stuff's not going to change, in my opinion. Um, I think if, if you're a talented athlete, that will rise, that will shine through, whether you're at Duke or, you know, Wake Forest would probably take umbrage to that comparison. But, you know, in any other, if you're good enough to play at Duke or North Carolina or Auburn or Alabama, then that's where you're going to end up for a lot of reasons other than just NIL. Well, I was going to say, Ray, I mean, what's the difference now uh, than, you know, with the use of image and likeness? Uh, Amy, I want to go back to one good point you made in the prior comment. Ray, the fascinating thing is Division Two and Three has driven the popularity and acceptance of collegiate esports. Now, if you if you if you if you look at who's woefully lagging, the Power Five is woefully lagging. Two and Three has driven that, and I think you could see some video game stars uh, emerge out of Two and Three because because here's the other thing about the esports everybody was afraid of is that these kids are getting paid now and they want to be paid, and so um, you're going to see a whole I think you're going to see Division Two and Three continue to lead that. You know, Shrek, what you guys are doing, CSMG and the esports and and those types of things. Uh, and to Amy's point, two and three are going to be a hell of a lot more nimble and quicker and adaptation to market forces uh, than the Power Fives are. And so I think that esports could be a giant stalking horse uh, in this in this space. Vince, well, can you elaborate I, on yeah, that? Vince, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. The, the, the gamer, the, the, the monetization of the gamer is part of what they do. It's part of who they are. Uh, the casual gamer or the semi-competitive gamer still is looking to generate some type of revenue on their Twitch account. So they're out there getting followers. They're out there getting views. They're creating uh, videos on, on how to beat a certain level and, and how to achieve a certain uh, objective in the game. So it's part of it's part of the esport gamers mentality. We, we at the NJCAE we didn't take that away. We enhanced it and said yes, continue to do those things because it's who you are. We don't want to we don't want to hold them back. We don't want to stifle recruitment. We don't want to put a, a roadblock in front of them. And, and I see that clearly again, like you said, at the D two D three levels, but also we're starting to see that at some of the at some of the FCS schools as well. But yes, the, the gamer and monetization is already in place, and we just have to figure out ways to enhance it. Neil, can you just elaborate a little bit more on who's kind of jumped on board with the ECAC? Because I think that's a pretty good proxy to reinforce what Vince had indicated. In, in terms of partnerships or schools? In terms of schools that have jumped on board. I mean, there are a number of Power 5 schools that are on board, but primarily... It's, it's also not necessarily the academically elite schools. It's the schools that are trying to get out ahead of some of the application and admission challenges, which were existent in the coming years, but now have been exacerbated by this COVID situation. Well, again, I can, I can give you some personal examples at Caldwell University. We started an esports program last year. 
they joined the ECAC. Enrollment has gone up. Uh, it, it's, it, it's a major force on campus now. Uh, they have their own jerseys. They're, they're selling stuff in the bookstores, et cetera. Syracuse University, obviously a power five uh, school is part of uh, is part of the ECAC for gaming. Uh, that that trend isn't going to stop. That's going to continue. Uh, again, esports we, we may want to put in a different category, but the reality is the model is there, the path is there, and uh, and certainly from an NIL perspective, uh, it, it's certainly the right way. It, it's a good way to follow. Uh, the NCAA could do could do worse than following that. Absolutely. And, and then Ray, and Ray, 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 one thing before we throw it to Dr. Schiller, because I, I want to see what he would say if he were the chairman of the NCAA now. But, but you, the thing we haven't talked about NIL is that these kids are the most sophisticated consumer that's ever been because of social media and technology. So we're all looking at this in a vacuum or a bubble. But my 20-year-old son has been playing video games and been online since he was a baby. So, you know, this is the generation that um you know and, and I, I would believe believe we would be remiss if we didn't ask the kids what the hell they think about all of these rules and what would make it work from their end i think you know we're all in our towers but we're going to be remiss if we don't really ask who the actual talent on the playing competition field is to help drive some of these rules as well no absolutely dr schiller well maybe it's good to have a historical perspective because i'm probably the when you said 50 years of experience. So prior to 1982, the NCAA controlled all television for college football. And the money that they garnered from the networks was distributed, not evenly, but almost every school uh, in Division I benefited by that. In 1982, Oklahoma Board of Trustees sued the NCAA as Georgia and Texas and other schools that were members of the College Football Association and the courts held that the public had a right to see all college sports anytime they wanted to. So that started what you see now. And what has happened is, yes, you can see, like my alma mater, the Citadel on uh, a streaming television, but the money has been really pushed to the other power five and some, a few other schools that are independents. So as we move forward now, it's somewhat, it, to me, it's somewhat similar. There have been some rules and now it's going to be that it's a free for all in terms of how sponsors money can get to not just individuals, but groups of individuals and others. It's taken 40 years to get to where we are from the court order that balanced television, uh, college sports on television. I'm not sure it might not take another 40 years to get us to where there's some equality to the way monies are distributed among individuals and others that play college sports. Amy, you want to add to that? And we'll jump ahead a little bit towards competitive fairness. Again, appreciate that you're joining us and recognize you have a crucial meeting that you have to jump off in about seven minutes. So maybe you can add a bit to uh, what Dr. Schiller just indicated as it relates to distribution of money, competitive fairness, small market versus big market, blue chip schools versus other schools, et cetera. Yeah, I've, I'm just one that sort of Thanks. This is, as I said earlier, a really great opportunity for everyone at, at the top end of the spectrum, at the bottom end of the spectrum. I don't think that it, we have fundamental differences in how people are generating revenue and how they're spending their money today. I, I think this is just one more variable. It's a big one. There's no question about it. <clears throat> and seismic, seismic is, is a term I think some Vince or Harvey said earlier. There's no question that that is it. But at the end of the day, I think there are just some inherent things that are generally fixed about our system <clears throat> and the segments in our system that this doesn't this doesn't change that much. And that's you know I don't know if it's pessimistic or optimistic or wherever camp that falls. But I, I just think in the, in the big picture of things, this is another another element that is important. It will have an impact, but it, it it's not going to have like a disproportionate impact pro or, or con at the top end, the middle, or the bottom. We're all gonna benefit, we're all gonna have to deal with the struggles in our own way it, relative to our where we sit in the division. And that, that's true of everything uh, that we experience in college athletics. So I think this is, isn't gonna change it that much in, in terms of the disparity be, between subdivisions. Thank you for the global perspective on making the pie bigger. Perhaps, um, again, you can add more so from your perspective with the Big East and NCAA and ACC. 
how do you start, how do you manage boosters? How do you address boosters that may have a car dealership somewhere and they may want to pay a Zion Williamson a, a million dollars to put out three tweets and make two appearances? That's clearly above market value, no matter how you slice it in terms of what his commercial activity is worth versus what he is worth economically to the entire Duke program. Yeah, right. That's why I work in a conference office and not on a campus uh, to not have to enforce it. But no, I think those are the really important uh, regulatory challenges that are going to have to be solved. I, I believe that there are really smart people trying to solve that. And at the end of, and I think we'll get to a place where we might be able to measure that fairly and monitor it fairly. But just like we have a lot of rules right now that people break. If someone wants to break that rule and pay a student athlete more than what the going rate is, they're going to do that. And it's just on the system as to whether we're going to be able to track and, and catch that. You know, I don't, I don't think that that changes it. Again, it's another complicating factor, but we've got, we've got rules getting broken, unfortunately, uh, more often than not around money. And this is just one other way that people are going to be able to do that now um, for, for better or worse. It, it, it just is, we can't, we can't protect it. Uh, from happening because it will happen. Well, Jason, what we're, would, what we're, would right, you, we're right at a debate to be an argument over fair market value versus free market value. So we pretty much know, I mean, and, and Zion is such an exceptional situation because Zion created a rating rise with ESPN and their coverage of college basketball, which could be equated to tens of millions of dollars in the ESPN coffers and the Nike coffers and all that. So, you know, while I, you know, obviously he's a generational, you know, kid, um, all of us in the business know what the fair market value is for most of these things. And, and again, I've been selling sponsorships for many, many years and Dr. Schiller was spot on. Look at the NFL. There may be five guys, Peyton, Russell Wilson, Mahomes, Brady, that get the bucks, handful in the NBA. Uh, the market typically, if we'll allow the market to govern this with some fairness principles, with the fair market value, it hopefully would weed out some of these situations. But I mean, Amy's spot on. We're going to have it. We've always have it, had it, and, um, and, and, and it's always going to, be, going to be had. But as I say, there's as many car dealers in Appalachian State as there are Tuscaloosa. So, um, you know, and there's only so many scholarships to go around anyway. And Alabama's getting the kids anyway. So, I mean, I think some of this is much ado about nothing. Jason, what would you add to that? Because you're so close. Vince, you're saying it's not about the car. It's not about the car, Dr. Schiller. I, I, think, the convert, I, I think the question is kind of moot because the NCAA can't do anything about how much an Alabama booster is going to pay their football players because they don't have an antitrust exemption. So you can't suppress value of anyone unless the Congress says you have the right to do that. Otherwise you're engaging in mo monopolistic behavior. And it's highly unlikely that the NCAA is gonna get a antitrust exemption. If they do get an antitrust exemption, it also means that they're gonna have to give up a lot of other things like the ability for coaches and athletic directors to make significant amounts of money. And so it's not going to be that easy. And I think the NCAA is probably much better off staying away from going down that path because it's going to fundamentally change the way they do business. The point is that the Zion Williamson's of the world, if they can garner millions of dollars from boosters, that's just the way that it works. And at some point that booster is going to get tired of paying all that money and things are going to get equalized. Um, Dr. Schiller, would you add anything to uh, to that perspective as well? Because it just seems as though this could, um, I guess it could just bring some of the things above board that have been below board. You're on mute, Dr. Schiller. I hope that happens. Uh, I think this virus has had a dramatic change on us as individuals and a dramatic change on the marketplace. So there are no easy solutions that will occur in the next few years until there's a vaccination that opens the markets up freely. By that time, there's gonna be a lot of decisions made by students and student athletes and what's going on now in terms of transitions into the professional leagues. And we may not see the star athletes that we've seen in the past in the college world as often happens in sports like baseball and hockey. 
So um, I, I really appreciated the comments that everyone made, and I've been looking at a bunch of the chats as we spoke, and there's a hell of a lot smarter people on the chat world than there is on this panel, let me tell you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, one question that has come up quite a bit, and Amy, thank you very much. No, you have to jump off. Appreciate your insights greatly. Um, third party rights holders, that's been raised by a number of, of folks in the chat room. Uh, how do we see that kind of coming down, Vince? You seem to have a very uh, strong perspective on the business model evolving uh, from an anti, as you stated, an antiquated one to maybe getting more antiquated quickly in terms of buying out rights versus more of a partnership. Um, how do you see this evolving and how do you see it applying to the whole NIL landscape? Well, I, and again, I, I'm bullish on the NIL because if you look at the, at the business model of college athletics today, even before the virus, the business model was in jeopardy. Uh, cord cutters is driving rights fees down from the ESPN side. Uh, IMG Learfield, the, the model of paying a college millions and millions of dollars uh, is, uh, is, is, is in jeopardy. Uh, as well, and now you've got what happens with tickets and you know season tickets and donors who now don't have that ha that discretionary income, and we're uncomfortable sitting on very uncomfortable you know stadium seats at, at, at college stadiums versus the, the dome. So, as again, this is a uh, this is going to accelerate. Uh, Dr. Schiller said another 40 years. In a normal world, he would be correct, but I think uh, you're going to see a massive overhaul within the next three to five years, if not sooner, in all of these universities that were in an arms race with millions of dollars of buildings and these absurd buyouts for failing with coaches. Um, those days are over. So I think NIL is actually going to be helpful to the student athletes and in the athletic department uh, long term. I think it could be not a saving grace, but certainly a helping grace. Absolutely. Do you think the coaches will suffer from this overall? The coaches? The money that coaches get, do you think they will suffer more? Uh, I think it's going to flatline the salaries because the, bon the, the booster money is not going to be there. And like I said, my alma mater is the worst at paying coaches to fail, millions and millions of dollars. And if you've got donors and boosters who have taken giant hits in the stock market or real estate values – uh, they're going to be less prone to pony up, uh, you know, to pay that $40, $50 million, you know, to you know, lose eight games. Uh, I just don't see – and that wasn't sustainable anyway, um, Dr. Schiller, and it never should have been sustainable, quite frankly. Jason, what would you add to that as, as a perspective from looking at it through the coach's lens? How, how do you see this changing both in terms of their income – for coaching as well as their ancillary income as it relates to footwear and things of that nature. I can see Vince's perspective in terms of money from boosters flowing mm -hmm. to the student athletes now before it goes to the coaches, but the coach is probably the most important person in a program. And so schools are going to still pay top dollar. I think the effects of COVID and everything that we're going through right now are going to have far longer reach and reaching consequences than NIL will over the next decade when it comes to coaching salaries. Um, and again, you go back to an antitrust exemption. If you create an antitrust exemption, then you have an opportunity to potentially suppress coaching salaries, which may or may not work. But I'm not really sure how all that is going to play out. I'm not too worried. I, I'm not worried about NIL you know, reducing coaching salaries right now as much as I am revenue from television rights and ticket sales over the next couple of years because of everything that's going on. Neil, do you see that there may be some certification issues as it relates to third-party marketing agents as it works for the league um, PAs, for example, or, or exchanges where athletes can be connected to sponsors? The, the the reality is is the, the rules are still have to be made right we still don't know where this is all going to fit as i mentioned earlier that blurred line uh of agency representing the athlete and, and the agent representing the the marketing of the athlete right so you have to be careful there and make sure that it's clear will there be a registration uh you know a, a registration requirement a test requirement Will there have to be a, a delineation between the two? Because that's going to be that's going to be hard to monitor, and it's certainly going to be hard to enforce. 
that agent with dual roles, uh, what role is he, is, he, is he working in and which role is he, is he representing the player in? So, uh, yeah, I think there's going to have to be some regulation. But, you know, as we know, the, you know we live in a, in a world where regulation ties up the free market and it ties up the ability to, to make money. So uh, the balance has to be struck. Uh, but, but I think if we don't, if we don't err on the side of, of caution when it comes to compliance, we're going, th this whole thing can spiral completely out of control. And I think that has to be at the, at the, at the, at the forefront of everybody's thinking at the NCAA. Dr. Schiller, what would you add to this? Because you, you've seen the development and growth in, in power and influence of all the player associations. How would you see this thing shaken out over time? Well, <clears throat> You know, maybe Vince is right about things will move more rapidly than I've said earlier. Um, I, I don't think that there's an easy solution to anything that we've talked about. So there'll be, there'll be victims at this. Sometimes it'll be the schools or smaller conferences, or, and sometimes it'll be the player themselves. And the expectation that they may make a lot of money may move them more towards becoming professionals. So, the, who is going to represent these players and getting these things done? And are they going to do their own licensing deals, their own esports relationships? The complexity of this is too much for, for anyone, I think, to really understand and come up with a simple solution. Oh, thank you very much. Um, as it relates to a question from the crowd, as it relates to uh, players as ambushing of the official sponsors of those schools, how do we see that materializing, Vince? Um, you know, for example, if you're representing Coke and pe a school is a Pepsi school, do you see that as an incremental opportunity? Do you see it as a challenge to doing school deals? Does it differ between levels? Well, now I see a shout out to Raskin here, Peter Raskin, who, who answered, uh, who asked one of those questions. Um, you know, you know, Ray, it is a, um, you know, we've, we've all talked about this clearing house issue and Coke is a great example. And, and, and again, it's going to be a lot of gray area because you've got, sometimes you've got a situation where Coca-Cola is paying the university directly. Sometimes they're paying the university and the athletic department. Sometimes they're paying the third tier right holder. So those issues, those rights are all over. And sometimes you have campuses that actually serve both products. So um, I do think that there's probably going to have to be some, uh, some clearing house other than if a player, and I, this was part of the NIL NCAA rules, if, if it's just Trevor Lawrence and not Trevor Lawrence of Clemson and he's not wearing a Clemson jersey, um, that's, a whole nother, that's a whole nother set. And Dr. Schiller said, hey, you know, there's going to be winners and losers of this in gray areas for sure. But to Jason's point, um, these companies may want to allocate different dollars and say a little bit less than – uh, to an athletic department or rights holders and a little bit more to the to the to the student athlete but I only see the dollars growing because there's going to be more people that want to get into this that heretofore hadn't been able to get into it. but it is going to create a problem for the rights holders and the sponsors for sure and they will have a big say in it as well no, I, I uh, appreciate that perspective uh, does anybody want to add to that because to me this is going to be definitively a challenge um, let's, uh, let's kind of move on to a couple of the other questions and, uh, and perspectives. Uh, Greg Moore raised the fact that from the standpoint of licensing rights, compensation, et cetera, it may be possible that we should be looking at some of the models that take place in the music industry, for example. Is, is that something that may be something that we could learn from, uh, adapting from across uh, the aisle from sports into entertainment? Neil, do you have a perspective on that at all? Uh, I think, uh, again, right now, any model is, is open for uh, examination and analysis. The music industry certainly, um, you know, they started off roughly also, right? They had their issues at the beginning in terms of paying the artists, and, and that certainly has flipped now. So maybe learning from their mistakes early and, and following their model now can certainly work. Um, I know uh, Commissioner Moore certainly has some good uh, – some good insights and, and, and to raise that, that issue means he's already given that some thought. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's certainly a model to follow. Uh, but, but again, as I mentioned earlier, there's still, there's still a lot of, uh, of areas that we just don't know how it's all going to fit. And, uh, and I think there's going to be a lot of trial by error 
And, uh, and as I mentioned, there's going to be a lot of burden on these schools to make sure they're in compliance with rules that quite honestly aren't going to be completely fleshed out. And, and so that, that's going to be a big part of this as well. And, and quite frankly, I think one way to avoid a lot of this is to focus more on the teams first than the individual players and allow uh, the schools to kind of get their feet wet and understand how this whole thing works. Uh, focusing that way uh, as opposed to the individual player might be a smarter way to start off and then and dive into the individual players later. And Jason, how does this extend out to coaches? Because they already cannot compete with the, um, the official sponsor of the school, correct? That's correct. Yeah, I've never represented a coach that didn't have something in their contracts that said that they specifically cannot endorse somebody that's competing against the university. A lot of coaches at the Power of Five level already have part of their salary paid out by the Nikes and Coca-Colas of the world. And so I cannot imagine a scenario in which student athletes at any large level are going to be allowed to, to endorse competing products. I mean, if Coca-Cola is paying a university a million dollars a year, Pepsi is not going to ambush market them by getting all of their student athletes to start tweeting about their product. It just doesn't make sense. It's impossible. The system is that universities and the NCAA are going to protect the schools first and foremost before they allow student athletes to monetize anything. No, no excellent. And then moving moving along to esports, Neil. It seems as though from an esports standpoint, uh, where the ECAC in particular is, is kind of way beyond even where any of these NIL changes being contemplated. Uh, come into play. So um, what kind of opportunity does that create? It, it just seems as though the esports world is already kind of past where NIL is, and it that could in fact challenge the NCAA's ability to get into esports, not that they don't have their hands full over the next couple of years with everything else. Well, again, the, the fact that the ECAC created their own esports uh, association within the association, they have their own bylaws, they have their own compliance uh, regulations and requirements, it does give them the leg up and, and allows uh, those schools to be able uh, to join the ECAC for esports and be under those guidelines as opposed to NCAA guidelines. So there is a competitive advantage to join in the ECAC. There's a competitive advantage to junior colleges joining the NJCAAE in terms of uh, those uh, NIL rights that, like I said, are already in place. So uh, again, the NCAA has to figure this out. Uh, we've already taken steps in those associations to do that. Uh, I think our model works and, uh, and certainly there is opportunity to have those discussions. But I, until the NCAA figures this out, I don't see how they can get into esports. It's just not going to fit. So moving on from uh, moving on from that, let's let's focus on key categories and and new opportunities. Um, how is this going to influence uh, equipment, apparel, and footwear? Uh, will it be possible for athletes, individual athletes, to do their own footwear deal? Um, and that may in fact influence, create less influence potentially in terms of an Adidas versus uh, Nike situation as it relates to a Zion Williamson or something of that nature. Well, Neil, um, Neil, here's a, here, let's take it one step further. Uh, I had a discussion with some, uh, some folks in college athletics and as it related to recruiting and a lot of these kids now are actually designing their own clothes and their own apparel and their own music videos and those types of things. And so, why would we stop a kid from allowing to you know, enter the world of capitalism in a market based, based on if that contract with the say Under Armour and Auburn was very specific against performance wear on the field and those types of things. And so again, I, I I'm all for the upside of allowing uh, this kid to monetize that because if that kid was not playing uh, sports at Auburn and he was my son, and he hit on, say, the next Toms or whatever that was, there's no reason to not allow him uh, to be able to do that. And he happens to have athletic gifts to build a social platform and social presence. So, um, yeah, I, I, I just yeah, think and, and, and Vince, the, uh, the, 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 the corollary to that are, those, are the STEM students, right? The ones that are working in, in a lab or working on a computer and, they, and they've created something new that can be – an advancement in technology and they get a patent or something and they create value from that. 
it's the same concept, right? Whether you create a video, you create a song, or you create a, a, a piece of apparel, concept is still the same. So they should be able to profit off of their, uh, their hard work, their intelligence, and what they've created. And, and it's funny because I teach, you know, uh, e-sport business management and creation of, of entrepreneurial uh, skills. And some of the ideas these students come up with are pretty clever and, and could be, you know, industry changing. Why should they not be able to, to do that if they're gamers and be able to go out there and capitalize on their ideas and their hard work? So I totally agree with you on that point. Let's let's um let's go to some of the audience questions specifically, and then we'll uh, leave five minutes at the end to wrap up with everybody sort of on the panel key takeaway conclusions implications. Uh, Andrew Massey raised: Is there any thought to group licensing fees being pooled and used for health and safety issues for the athletes? For example, medical costs uh, as it relates to post separation from the school. Dr. Schiller, would you like to add anything on that one? I think, having... he's, I think he's right. I think that's something that could be considered. These are all things that will go in the box of where the money may or may not go. Um, obviously, I think there's a real need for that based upon some of the injuries that intercollegiate athletes have at every level. Uh, but again, it adds to the complexity of it. I, I think most student athletes uh, only think in the short term, not the long term. So maybe we have to do some thinking for them. Another good question um, that came up from Kennedy, will Title IX be a factor in how much males versus females athletes may, may earn from uh, all of the emerging NIL opportunities? My, my interpretation of that question, and it is a great question, is I don't see how it could in the sense that if it's a, if it's a market player that's paying the athlete and it's not governed by the school or by the NCAA, I don't know how it falls under Title IX. So, uh, certainly, uh, it's an issue, but I, I don't know how the uh, the NCAA can regulate a company determining what the market price is for an endorsement type deal that we're talking about. And I think it's going to bring I think it's going to bring new money in because if you look at the traditional sponsor categories within college athletics now, I mean, what are there fifteen or twenty different categories? You know, max. I think it's going to horizontalize that because you've got tens of thousands of, of empowered female athletes who are massive influencers that companies are going to want to come in and attach themselves to to promote their products that heretofore that money was never going to come in to college athletics. I think it's going to be, I don't look at it in terms of, of, of Title IX. I look at it in terms of, of, of market opportunities the way I look at it. Because if I, I've got clients that make a lot of female-oriented products now and prospects coming in saying, hey, we want to attach ourselves to these great women competitors because it's a great example of how to demonstrate our product and the empowerment position in the marketplace. So again, I think it's going to be a, a nice panacea on the other side of this and could be a salvation to non-rev title nine sports and a lot of athletic departments. I, I agree, Vince. And that's why it's not, going to, be how, yeah. it's not going to be an NCAA issue or a school issue. It's going to be the individual athlete or team issues because see what's happened in ice hockey and soccer with women teams. The demand for equal pay, regardless of where the sponsorships may fall or where the TV revenues fall. So I think you're gonna see potential of some litigation when big money comes in, not the little money, on behalf of teams or individuals that participate in teams, as we've seen across the board now, an equalization of pay for professional athletes. I, I agree completely with you, Doc. Dr. Schiller, that's uh, that's exactly what I'm thinking. I don't see how it becomes a Title IX issue because the, the colleges and NCAA can't regulate it. Hey, hey Dr. Schiller, that would be a high-class problem because I would love to be able to bring a Procter & Gamble into college athletics that's never been there and dump it all into the women and see how that works out in the marketplace. You're showing a little bit of sexist by picking Procter & Gamble. <laughs> <laughs> I was deferring to your Olympic days. Okay. So it's a brilliant thought. Let's just spend a couple of minutes um, on, uh, on national versus state. Uh, Colorado and California have stepped in with their own regulation. And now NCAA is going to try to take this to Congress. Um, what do you all see as, as some of the ramifications of this, the likelihood of this, where this should end up versus where it may well end up, Dr. Schiller? Do you have a perspective on that? I think there's always been the threat of states to do certain things on behalf of college athletics, ranging from fees on tickets to all sorts of things. I think 
once there's a clear national kind of discussion that takes this to a better place, I think all of that disappears. Yeah, um, that sounds like a spot on what I think. Anybody have a different perspective on the panel than that? I, well, I think, uh, go ahead, Vince. Go ahead. I was gonna say, I think that what California and Colorado did was smart in the sense that they got this conversation going and it got the dialogue started. Um, ultimately, there's going to have to be one policy uh, that governs across college athletics because otherwise states would have a, you know, would, would be able to create unfair advantages, uh, competitive advantages for their schools as compared to others. So ultimately, there should be one policy that governs all schools in all, all states. Yeah, but, 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 you know, Ray, uh, according to my sources, the NCA is basically toothless in Congress. It's not a very popular institution in Congress. Jason pointed clearly out the antitrust issues. And if you haven't read Taylor Branch's article in the uh, October 2011 Atlantic, the classic definition of student athlete is tied into much greater federal funding issues for colleges and universities. Um, it's, a, it's, a complicated, it's a complicated slope, but you know, many of us like myself have been begging the NCA to evolve for many years from an enforcement to an enhancement institution only to be met, met by deaf ears. And I think it's ironic now that the state legislatures force the hand on the NCA on the NIL issue uh, as well. Uh, we all could have been doing a lot of this all along. And so, um, again, I don't believe they've got many friends in the halls of Congress, in my professional opinion. Jason, let's circle back to you on that since you weighed in so heavily and articulately earlier on this subject. <laughs> Jason? Yeah, I'm here. I'm okay. here. I'm, I'm just gathering my thoughts as to the, I'm, I mean, I'm with Vince. I don't think that the NCAA wants to mess around with Congress. Uh, I think that they're gonna, they have no choice, right? So there are some states, all of this has been politically motivated, right? You have uh, these state senators and congressmen and whoever else that are using this to pretend that they care about student athlete rights because it's a hot topic. They're gonna get a lot of publicity around it. And so they're pushing all this different legislation. So perhaps they did accelerate the name, image, and likeness issue a little bit. Congress is going to make sure that the NCAA allows them to come in and create this exemption. I would not put it past uh, certain states to pretend that they want even more lax rules than whatever the NCAA comes up with. And I wouldn't be surprised if the NCAA basically says, that's fine, but then we're just not going to let your universities participate in our championship events. If that's what's going to happen, if, if Florida is not going to acquiesce to these rules, then the NCAA is not gonna mess around because the NCAA has already made pretty significant concessions in all of this. I think everyone was surprised to see that they were gonna essentially allow for a free market. And I think the rules that are gonna get voted on in January are gonna be as good as we're gonna get for a first round. Uh, and if there's still some states that are gonna to wanna to mess around with this, I don't see why the NCAA would worry about one or two states. Uh, it was a bigger issue when it was 50 of them, but if you have a handful of them, the NCAA is going to say, okay, that's fine. You're just not going to play by our rules. Jason, just building on that, let's kind of go around the horn real quick. Your one major takeaway from today's discussion, and, uh, and then we'll turn it back over to Mike to talk about the rest, to wrap up and talk about the rest of the series. So, Jason, your, your most crucial my, takeaway. My takeaway is that there are a lot of unknowns. Some of them are going to become knowns uh, in January when we know exactly what the rules are but there is going to be a massive market available to student athletes and third-party entrepreneurs and agencies and everybody else to take advantage of 12 to 18 months from now. Uh, how all that shakes out, we have no idea, but I do think, and I, I will give this back to Harvey, the COVID thing is going to be a lot bigger of an issue for the future of the NCAA and these universities than NIL will be. NIL is going to help ensure that we have college athletics for a long time but the COVID thing is going to shape it significantly more. Let's go to let's go to Neil and then Vince, and then we'll wrap up with Harvey, who can um, circle back on COVID or any other concluding perspectives from his uh, his seat at the top of the throne of the sports industry over the past several decades. So, uh, Neil, what's your perspective? Yeah, I, again, my takeaway from today uh, is the the esports uh, piece of college athletics or college sports, whatever you want to call it. 
that's already here in terms of NIL. Players are already monetizing themselves and earning a revenue for what they do as gamers. Um, I think the uh, NCAA can follow that model to a certain extent and, and do well. Um, I think the, uh, the eSports has also figured it out when it comes to women uh, gamers. Uh, there's, there's competitions now solely dedicated to, to female gamers. And um, I, I, again, I think that's a great opportunity in this NIL space for women athletes, for Division Two and Division Three athletes uh, to, to capitalize and, and to help with their education in terms of paying uh, tuition or, or covering fees, et cetera. So um, I think the opportunities are endless and, I, and I'm excited to see how this, uh, how this shapes up in the next several months. Mitch? I think uh, three headlines. I think the core uh, business model, financial revenue model in college athletics is in severe jeopardy, accelerated by COVID. I think it's a great day for student athletes uh, with the ability with their name in the likeness and um, uh, to top it off, what would it take to bring Dr. Schiller back uh, to oversee a lot of these activities? And let's turn over to Dr. Schiller then to close. Thank you. Uh, I, I've been thinking about looking at the chats and listening to people. I'm sorry that people of my generation have screwed it up so bad. <laughs> and I, I deliver to all the people who are on the call who are younger and you're going to fix it because governance in intercollegiate athletics is not the NCA. It's the schools and their representatives as well. And everybody should remind themselves of that. So you can bring change. And all of us know that the COVID-19 has brought some special challenges. Local communities, states, and universities and colleges are going to have a hard time with the revenues they've expected in the past. They're not going to be there tomorrow. So they're going to look for new forms of revenue. And they're going to be tough decisions by college and university presidents on their athletic programs. What can stay and what not? You know, Furman just dropped baseball. What's next? It's gonna happen around America. And conferences are dropping championships except for football and basketball. I hear about this. So it's, it's up to everybody here to think about ways to get out of this pandemic and to fix things for the future and provide the right kind of governance that takes care of every potential intercollegiate athlete and student that really wants to play sports in college and, and really have a career that means something in their future. Thank you, everybody. Let's turn it over to Mike Schreck, our CEO, co-founder, for some closing remarks and uh, introduction of what's ahead as it relates to our series. Yeah, thank you, Ray. And, and thank you to all the panelists um, that participated today. We greatly appreciate your insight and perspective. A special thank you to everybody else that joined, taking time out of your busy schedules to discuss the name, image, and likeness topic. Um, I'll, I'll second Harvey's comments or Dr. Schiller's comments on the chat room. Certainly very insightful and appreciate everybody bringing their thoughts and perspective here. Hopefully we were able to answer, or the panelists were able to answer a lot of the questions that you had. Um, as it relates to the empowerment series, um, today was number one. We're gonna be doing this every other Tuesday uh, over the course of the next 10 weeks. The next one will be June 2nd, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern. The focus on that one is gonna be women in sports focused in and around issues in collegiate athletics. Um, we have confirmed a number of panelists uh, for that as well, so that's gonna be great. Be on the lookout for an invite and some more information as it relates to that panel. But certainly appreciate everyone's time today and. Uh, a big round of applause, even though I know you're all on mute for our panelists and appreciate everyone's time. So stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Be safe.